Welcome to episode four of your 2017 Monster Energy Supercross preview show here. Uh, Racer X, Jason Wygant, Steve Mathis, Jason Thomas here from Morgantown, West Virginia. We will have David Pingree with a report out in Southern California in a bit. Episode four, we're talking about veteran riders who have reached the heights. They've seen what it's like on the podium, sometimes in the middle top step of that podium, champions, but all needing a little bounce back in 2017. The job security is no longer there. They need to perform this year. We're talking Davey Millsaps, Josh Grant, Trey Kennard, Blake Baggett, Weston Pike, Christophe Porcel. That's some serious talent with this group, but they need to show that talent again. The clock is running with other riders trying to move into this class. Yeah, certainly a real group, great group of experienced riders. I think these guys are going to be a lot of fifth to tenth place guy, but I wouldn't be surprised to see any of these dudes on the podium at, at a round and round this year in Supercross. Certainly some uh, some great racers, uh, and, and they have good accomplishments, like you said. One of the guys, I think the 18 of Millsaps, Davey Millsaps to me, I thought he had a really good 2016 going until the injury at Daytona. You know, he had missed all of 2014. 2015 Monster Energy Cali Rider, that was a disaster. And uh, he left the team about 10 rounds in and didn't race again that year. David Millsaps has not raced that much. Coming back last year, uh, I thought he was good. He won a heat race. He was, he was placing well, he was moving forward. I thought he was just gonna get better and better. So to me, uh, Kennard may be flashier, raw speed wise. Uh, Pike may be steadier, but I thought Millsaps was great. Yeah, I thought 2016 was a great bounce back for him. Uh, he was leading heat races, he was leading main events. Uh, the fitness going into the season he knew was going to be a bit of a problem and they were working towards that and they had goals towards the end of the season to be at 100% and really be able to put 20 laps together. And they were, I think they were getting there. You could see the flashes of brilliance. For, for eight laps, he was world class. Uh, and obviously the injury at Daytona was unfortunate, but he bounced back from that, went to Canada, put a great summer together. And I think he's in a very good place coming into the 2017 season. His mind is right. He's got the confidence from the 2016 season. You know, another year on that motorcycle and being more comfortable in the team. Uh, I, I expect him to be in contention again. Why are you wearing the famous orange gloves? Well, I felt it was only fitting as every rider in the segment is a part of the fly racing family. So I wanted to be a part of the fly racing family by wearing the gloves. Okay. Uh, his teammate over there, I guess also wearing the same gear, is Blake Baggett. Now he's new to the team. I feel like Baggett played this crazy offseason better than any other rider. There was a lot of riders, not so many spots. Baggett never had to sweat it. He was locked into this deal early. I don't know if it's because he was more aggressive early on or took less money early on. Wasn't a lot of negotiating. Baggett's locked into a great spot. And I think people forget, Millsaps and Baggett on that Rocky Mountain ATVMC KTM team, same stuff that Dungey, Muscan, and Kennard have with the factory KTM team. So Baggett's got himself some good support and I think a little underrated and Supercross, even hearing some rumblings that at the test track, Baggett's riding very well right now. Yeah, I've heard the same things uh, from people who would be unbiased. People that were just happen to be, you know, bystanders at the track saying, wow, Baggett is really flying. And you've got, if you want to give somebody credit, give Blake Baggett credit for being proactive this off season. He saw the riding on the wall with the team situation and knew he wouldn't have a spot. And he also looked at the, the situation in the sport with more riders than rides. <clears throat> he went out, he locked up a very high quality spot on factory equipment early, while the rest of these guys, we look at, you know, guys we're gonna talk about later that are they're still left out in the cold. Baggett may have made the smartest moves this offseason of any rider out there. Don't forget too, uh, Baggett's working with Michael Byrne. And Michael Byrne worked with Alessi a couple years ago, of course, former factory rider. Yeah, he was given the keys. He's given the keys you to could Michael make, Alessi. You could make a serious point that Mike, Michael Alessi never looked better than when Burner was working with him. Burner's now working with Baggett. That's probably where JT gets his info from, a biased Michael Byrne. But having said that... I said unbiased. I know, but I, I find he doesn't. He okay. thinks you're biased about him being unbiased. Yeah, count Burner because Burner is in the biased category. Okay. I said unbiased. I, I you have unbiased, sure. I but you sure. also have Burner. I have unbiased uh, bystanders. Two years ago, Blake Baggett on the Yo Suzuki was underrated in Supercross. Yeah. JT, you said that you were going to walk home if he ever got a podium in a Supercross outside of Daytona. That is correct. And I believe he got a couple of fourths. So you you were I correct. Couldn't. First class. You were correct. But the point was, he was good. Blake Baggett yeah. was good. Yeah, last year he was hurt. That's kind of a wash. But maybe a little underrated in Supercross. We'll see, especially with good equipment and a full head of steam and burner on his side. Um, <clears throat> Weston Pike, and I almost say this every year on no, the show. No, wait, wait, we can't, we'll get to Pike in a second. No. We gotta talk about Trey Kennard. Okay. Before another fly rider. Trey Kennard's gonna have a different color front fender in the first time in, um, geez, probably his amateur days, uh, Kawasaki days. Well, as a pro. As a, as yeah, a pro. as a pro. Yeah. Um, 
he's going to be the real wild card. I've heard people tell me that they think he can get back to, you know, he has, once he stays healthy, he can get back to race wins and everything else. Trey Kennard, to me. Does that bias Tim Ferry? No, it is not. Okay. Uh, he's the biggest mystery of 2017 Supercross. Really? Yeah, because we, as little as two years ago, he was winning races. Yeah, right. Uh, now he's on a different brand new bike. Where where is Trey Kennard at? How old is he? He's pretty still pretty young. Well, he turned pro in 2006, so you've got to figure he's 26, 27, and that right around yeah. Dunge's yeah. age. Yeah. So but the problem with Kennard is that he's the injuries have been much more extreme than Dunge. So even though they're the same yeah. age, I, yeah. I'm out on Kennard. I don't. You know. don't even know. Podiums, twelfths. He's I not going to get twelve. Okay. He's not going to get twelve. I. In the history of Trey Kennard, I've never seen him ride around and get 12th. I've either seen him go for the podium or crash trying to get to the podium. That, that's what Trey Kennard does. That's what Stu did until last year when he, you know, rode around to get 14th in Atlanta. That's what these guys do. They don't know how to ride around and get 12th. But 12. why can't 2017 be the Stu year for the 41? I'm not saying it Nobody is. Nobody wants that. Nobody no, wants I, to be I'm the Stu year. Does the 41 fall off the cliff this year and this is the end? I'm going to or... pour you all of the hate emails. <laughs> Or does he just pick up? I mean, we know he can run. He can run the speed. This is what I'm saying. He's the biggest question mark to me. I don't. Know. I will give you that the window of expectations is pretty wide with yes. him. Maybe because the upside is so big. Because even Millsaps, as good as Millsaps has been in the past, he's not only two years removed from winning Supercrosses. Only Kennard is, and Kennard legitimately, literally, like beat Ken Roxon straight up in 2015 yeah, in San Diego. Yeah. And I feel like going into the Anaheim One main event last year, qualifying and the heat race. I thought Kennard looked better than any other rider only one year ago. Absolutely. And then it imploded 10 laps into great, the main he event. Had, he had a great main event until, yep. yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, the, the potential's there. I don't think 12 places are there. I, I know what you're saying, JT. Biggest, biggest question mark to me. Well, what I'm upset about is that I already had started talking about Pike, matter. and you just you just did a Pike on me yeah, we, and just took me out. You were freeze and I was Pike. You, yes. Yeah. yeah, you just rained down yeah, yeah. haymakers. Uh, right. let, let's reset here. We're going to send it to David Pinger out in California. And uh, here's the question for you, Ping. You get a rider that's in a situation where he has to perform. Is that extra pressure? Is that something that you think is running through the mind of these riders into the offseason and when the races actually begin? I got to get another ride next year. Yeah, guys, you know, you're going to hear a lot of riders talk about how they're just taking it a day at a time. They're not really thinking about those pressures or rides. That's a lie. I mean, in the back of your head, you're not going to get rid of the thought that, okay, I've, I've got to start getting some results in. Uh, if you've had some good weekends, you can kind of rest on that a little bit. Like, okay, well, the last couple races haven't been good, but I've had some good finishes in Supercross or vice versa. But at the end of the day, these guys are thinking about, you're always thinking about the future. You've got to put some results in to be able to get a ride the following season. That's just the way it works. We're a very results-driven sport. Uh, I will say that uh, the pressure can either make you rise to the occasion uh, some guys that thrive on that, it'll make them work harder, it'll make them hungry, it'll make them maybe take some chances they other, otherwise wouldn't take, or it can crumble you. You know, guys sometimes under that pressure, uh, they, they just become paralyzed with the fear. So we'll see how these guys handle it. You know, a lot of them are veterans, some of them are not. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how they perform when the chips are down. The real bummer about a season like this is, and another real f factor that comes in is injury. You start to you know, play against it, against yourself going, okay, well, if I push too hard and I get hurt, well, then I'm really out. So I don't want to get hurt, but I still need to ride kind of hard. I mean, you're trying to find that balance. And uh, if you get into your head and get lost in those thoughts too much, you're not helping yourself. You know, if these guys can go out and just, uh, just do their best during the week, put in the work, try to, try to get it out of their mind as much as possible, that's the best bet. That's why they're telling you that in those interviews. Oh, I'm not thinking about it. Yeah, sure you're not. So if they can't get through this season, they don't get a ride next year, you are gonna be feeling like a big zero. And that's a bummer. And if uh, then you can't put something else together with another team, maybe arena cross, and you're feeling like a real zero. Or like a boob. Back to you guys. Okay, that's uh, David Pingree analyzing the two different ways yeah. that things could go. Gotta get a feel. Really hands that. on. Ping is really I, hands on. I, I wish I was. I mean, that's the way it is in Southern California, man. That's, that's, that's the way it goes. Okay, so uh, finally, do I get to talk about Weston Pike now? Sure. Is it yeah, cool? Go you can allow this. Fly racing zone. Uh, Pike, 
He's so untested. His whole background and his whole situation is so unlike almost any rider in his position. I have no idea what to think. He was, this is his career. It was going up, up, up. Now we hit this weird spot last year. Started off with a fight. Uh, that maybe wasn't so surprising. We know Weston can be pretty tough guy sometimes. But then it kind of derailed this whole season. Got hurt. For the first time, Pike took a step back last year. So now I do not know what to expect. I know you think the canard window is pretty wide. Pike could be podiums. Pike could be out of the top 10. I don't know what to think about Pike. I believe he should bounce back to where he was in 15, where he had two podiums, but I don't know. I think pure raw speed, he's behind Kennard. Kennard's got more potential than, than, than Weston. Ceiling's higher. Yeah, I'll give you that. Yep. Uh, but JT, I think um, a couple things. The Anaheim one thing, psychologically getting suspended for two races, you know, missing Anaheim one, missing the next one, mm -hmm. that completely threw him, threw him off. And then he had a hard crash at Oakland. I think that people maybe missed it was on the last lap and he yeah. went down hard yeah, sure. and that was it. Yeah. Well, I think too, it's, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the word complacency because it's so negative, but I think Weston has always been the underdog. He's always felt uh, like he's been slighted by everyone. People didn't think he was capable of reaching a certain level. He reached that level. He got the paycheck according to that level. He, a lot of things become, became very easy in his life versus how mm -hmm. they were years before. So I think there was a, a time period in there, a lull, where he kind of got a little bit like, ah, I kind of made it. And I think there was a big wake up call in the middle of last year where he's like, man, I'm, I'm struggling here. The, the phone's not ringing like it was before. So I think this off season was a bit of a wake up call when he was, he was battling to get his job again with JGR. When he would go talk to other teams, they were, eh, we could take it or leave it. They were, there wasn't that urgency to sign Weston Pike like there was the previous year. So I think he will be out with something to prove again. I think he will be out to show JGR and every other team, this is why you signed me, this is why you need to pay me. Uh, so I look for, to see that fire rekindled. Yeah, I can believe that. That's why I think the potential's wide open with him. Yeah, I don't think the ceiling, Millsap's canard level, I'm not sure he's at that level of speed, but uh, I think he could be better than he was last year, which is still, that could be different between third and 12th. That's a pretty wide Don't forget, branch. he's on a Suzuki. He knows the Suzuki well. He, right. he rode it well as a privateer, then went, rode for the RCH. He's on a very familiar bike. Yeah, yeah, and I think he's happy with it. But then again, everyone that switches bikes in the off season says, bike's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Barsha told me everything, bike's awesome, we'll see. Uh, next on our list, we're gonna talk about uh, Christophe Porcel. Uh, wait, wait, we're saying that Canard, Millsaps, Pike have a wide range? Porcel, on any given one lap, can be the fastest motorcycle rider in the world, but in any given main event just gets 14th. That is a wide range. Who knows? And I know what you're gonna say. You, Leopards and lions don't change your spots, or zebras yeah, yeah. don't change zebras their... Zebras and stripes and leopards and spots. Okay, yeah. zebra stripes. You want to talk about the grant with that one, or I'm, I'm confused? <laughs> either one. Either one, one. okay. Guy. <laughs> Purcell's incredible. He's phenomenal. Yes. The way he kind of cruises in practice, checks out lines, and when he lays down that heater uh, that's oftentimes faster than anybody else, his, his line selection is really unique. He keeps his momentum up. He's an incredible, phenomenal rider. But Christophe Purcell is not going to push it to that extra bit to get on the box. He's just not gonna do it. He is what he is, zebra stripes. I was just wondering if last year he had the security, he knew he had a two year deal, no, we talked about that over no, it doesn't matter. No, he doesn't just, matter. he is what he is. Yeah. It's phenomenal, it's great to watch, but. And honestly, if you're gonna... fighting for a ride next year, that's when you see the dudes do it in the last five nationals. That's when they really yeah, start he, turning Christoph's up. not that kind of guy. He's gonna still continue to frustrate you fantasy owners, there's no doubt. But there was a lap last year, I think it was maybe Anaheim two, three, something like that. Yep. Anaheim 2. Yeah, I believe it was Anaheim 2. Where your your wig was blown back. Yes, it was in that time practice. That weird haircut of yours, we thought it was going to be gone. <laughs> Blew the wig off. There was, uh, this particular race was, uh, there was a long set of very, very difficult whoops along the outside, far side of the Anaheim Stadium. And I was like, ah, that's going to be tough for guys like Porcel, guys like Muscan. These, these very technical, but that's a very difficult section. Uh, he put in a lap, and I, I know you know this because I was texting you, I was calling and yelling at everyone with an earshot about this lap that I watched Christophe Purcell put in. It was one of the fastest laps I've ever seen put in on a Supercross track. And honestly, I've never seen anything like it since. No. So the ability is there, the talent's there. Even on whoops like that, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. So I think tapping into that is the thing that Christophe has always had a tough time doing. He, he can hit it at times, but to win a championship, to win races consistently at this level, to be a podium guy consistently, You've got to be able to find that every single weekend. And I think that's the magic that a guy like Ken Rocks and Orion Dungey has. 
whether the weekend's going good, bad, or indifferent, when it's race time, they find that level. I think Kristoff is hit or miss on finding that. But I think even Kristoff, who's had some battle, some serious injuries, and it admits that it lays in his mind and he thinks about it. Sure. Just to compound that, last year in Indianapolis, ruddy, soft track, yeah. very technical. He was riding great and killing it. And then what happens? He drags his pegs, goes over, you know, cartwheels, has a pretty bad crash. For a guy like that, like if he had stayed up, that could have changed something in him. But instead, it was probably like, why push it anymore? You know, I'm going to go down. What happened again. at Washougal? Same thing. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, he had actually ended up being an injury plague gear. That doesn't bode well for him. I also think that he's kind of like an artist. You give him a blank canvas, a track by yourself, he will paint and do amazing things that no one has seen before. But then when there's three dudes around him and he can't get to those lines, can't get clean racetrack to do what he wants to do, things start to change in a hurry. Well, that's that's how he was injured, right? Is a, a person crashed in front of him, he landed on them, or, or someone landed on him. The original injury, but it, yeah. Right, the, the right. one that basically plagues his, I think, his nightmares, you know, yeah. is that crash, and it wasn't his mistake. So yeah. that's, that's the tough part of racing, is a lot of times these injuries aren't your fault, but the close racing, the stuff where some you can get tangled up with someone, I think that bothers him. And that's why we see sometimes when he's in the heat of a battle, he just taps out and you see him just let the guy go. Yeah. Uh, sometimes he didn't, like Washugo, he didn't do that. We saw him pay the price for that. So it'll be interesting to see him have to make those decisions time in and time out, week in and week in. I agree. I would just love to see one main event where he hole shots and then actually go forward in the races. Who knows what could happen? It could be spectacular. And one more rider who, again, is of this type of uh, style, Josh Grant, the book is always, oh man, the talent, the ability, at any given time he can run with anyone. Now we haven't seen that from Grant in Supercross in a long time, but he's in a better position than he's been in. He is factory monster Kawasaki. He was unemployed at this time last year. We know how good that team is, how capable that team is. Uh, we will have to see with Josh Grant, although I think that old, at any moment you're gonna see Josh Grant run with anyone, I think he's matured. I think Josh Grant is the perfect guy to be on a team with Eli Tomek. Tomac goes for the wins. I see consistent, just solid, quiet rides from Grant all year long. That's what I think you're going to get from Josh Grant. This is not the 2009 Josh Grant any longer. No, I agree with you, Weege. A couple years ago, he had a pretty steady Supercross season. Never yeah. flashy, but steady. He got his ankles fixed. They were bothering him pretty good. Once he signed that factory Cowie deal, they said, hey, go get your ankles fixed yeah. and, and, and come back. So he's healthy. He's got a factory team, a full season of, off, uh, of testing and everything else. He's got a new gear company, Fly Racing. Um, but again, I, it's just going to be steadiness. Just stay away from injury and, you know, get some top tens and, and, and that's, that's solid. And that's what Cowie probably would like out of that position. Right. And, and obviously, you know, his brand that he started, Happy Living the Now. That's, I think that's what he's trying to be about. I think about. he's literally trying to be Absolutely. happy. Absolutely. Well, I think that was the genesis of that brand was, hey, I, I want to just enjoy what I'm doing. I'm going to try as hard as I possibly can, but I want to be there week in and week out. I want to enjoy what I'm doing. I want to have a good time where it's not that image of five years ago where he's throwing gang signs and it basically, you know, he's just a completely different person. I think that's obviously come with having children. I think we saw Chad Reed take that step in growth as a person as well. So I just see a different attitude from him at the races and I think that'll play out in his racing as well. A lot of good riders on this list and every single one of them has this big range of where they could finish. Can they mix it up with the riders we discussed previously, the Roxon uh, uh, and uh, Tomac and Dungey and Webb and Reed group? Uh, we'll see, but that's why we go into say, uh, Anaheim one every year saying hashtag deep field. I have two questions for you okay. guys. One, is there a rider on this list that you think does the best out of the list? And okay. two, why do you have a taco on a napkin over there? Well, we went to lunch between yeah. uh, episodes uh, three and this episode yeah. four, and I couldn't quite finish the Guadalajara special. I can't stop special. staring at it. I'm sure you can't. Yeah. So uh, you guys make your predictions on who's the best, and I paid for this, uh, this uh, burrito, and I'm going to eat it. You got uh, a bit of napkin stuck to the... Uh, hey, that's even more for my money. Uh, what do you think, JT? Uh, number of podiums from uh, these five, six guys. I'm going to take highest result for the season is going to be Trey. Mm -hmm. I think he's capable of winning a race. If not, he will he will find a podium somewhere. Uh, but I think overall, your season highest placing in the points, I'm going to go with Pike. I like Pike over 17 rounds. Well, folks, that has been the uh, episode for the Vets uh, Monster Energy AMA Supercross Series. Go to supercrosslive.com, and uh, we'll be back uh, to talk some more with uh, this guy's host when he's done his taco. Oh, Christian, I'm going to finish the highest up in the points. Couldn't have said it better myself. Mm -hmm. Yep.